When I was in college, I had the privilege and opportunity to play intercollegiate sports, baseball and football. And I got to know a few players on the other teams over the years, especially if they were in our conference. But basically, in the two or three hours I was on the field with them, they were my adversaries. And when the game was over, they were gone. They left San Antonio. They were out of my life for probably another year. And my basic feeling was good riddance. I also played intramural softball in college. There I was playing against my friends. After the game was over, they were still my friends. They were still a part of the university community. They were still a part of my life. As we begin chapter 14 of Romans this morning, Paul is talking intramurals. He's talking about how fellow believers in a particular congregation are to treat each other. Now, some of you are saying, well, Ron, we already know the answer to that. You've already taken us through Romans 13, and we've learned that for the Christian, there's only one option in how you treat anybody, and that's to love them, meaning to act lovingly toward them, whether or not they're on your team or, or not. But what Paul's going to do this morning, he's, he's going to get a little more specific, and he's going to raise a rather testy issue. And it's this, what about when one believer disagrees with another believer over a lifestyle issue where scripture is silent? He's not going to be talking about issues like human sexuality or business ethics or racial relations where scripture is absolutely crystal clear. No, no, those areas where, where scripture is silent and a believer holds one position and another believer holds another. I have this rule of thumb that goes like this. Where the Bible is clear, then you and I need to be graciously firm and unwavering. Where the Bible is ambiguous, we probably need to assume a posture of humility and hold very tentatively to whatever position we do hold and maintain a teachable spirit. And where the Bible is silent, that might be a clue for you and me to keep quiet as well. When we lived in Baltimore, the Presbyterian church that was in, within walking distance of our house was thrown into a tizzy. A volatile debate broke out between an elder and the senior pastor. I mean, this thing got heated. It threatened to divide the church. And the debate was over whether Christians should celebrate Christmas. I am not kidding you. Now, before you laugh and think, well, that, that's just crazy, that is a part of our heritage as Presbyterian slash Reformed Christians. We're, we're Johnny-come-latelys to celebrating Christmas, really kind of 19th century. Um, back during the Reformation, we, we kind of said, you know, if the Bible's not clear about it, let's not do it. And the Bible says nothing about celebrating Christmas or not. We don't even know what day Jesus was born on. So you've got an issue with another believer, and they believe one thing and you believe another, but the Bible's silent on it. What do you do? What Paul really wants to do is he wants to talk about how we relate to each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's see what he's talking about. Turn with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 14. We're going to look at verses 1 through 9 this morning. And let's pray together before we read. Holy Spirit, open our hearts and minds now to your word that we might clearly understand it, that we might gratefully receive it, and that we might faithfully apply it to our lives for Jesus' sake. Amen. And now hear God's word addressed to you and me, beginning to read at verse 1 of Romans chapter 14. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains. And let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, 
since he gives thanks to God. While the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Please pray with me again. And now, Father, as my words are true to your word, may they be taken to heart. But as my words should stray from your word, may they be quickly forgotten. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I'm a part of a national covenant group of 40 evangelical Presbyterian pastors. We've been together for 31 years. We take a, a week out of the year every year, and we meet together at a conference center somewhere in the U.S., a few years ago, we were meeting at a conference center in Florida. It was a conference center owned and operated by a parachurch organization who, understatement, uh, is very, very, very socially conservative. So much so that we actually had to sign a covenant before we came saying that while we were there, staying at the conference center, we would not smoke, we would not drink alcohol, and we would not uh, look at movies, even off campus. Okay? I had no problem with that. It's their rules. We're going there. Good price. I gladly signed it. The first night, we were welcomed by the executive director. Couldn't have welcomed us more warmly and graciously. He said they were so honored to have a group of Presbyterian pastors here tonight that after his orientation center session with us, uh, they'd arranged their video lounge so that they were going to show uh, the film, A Man Called Peter, the story of Peter Marshall, great Presbyterian Scottish pastor, and they were going to pop popcorn for us and have sodas and all that kind of stuff. And I'm sitting there going, is this a trap? Um, I raised my hand and I said, um, I'm just curious. I signed a thing and I'm, I was glad to do it, stating that I would not watch a movie while I was here. Now you're inviting me to watch a movie. Oh, no, no. He said, it's not that at all. He said, this is a video, not celluloid like in a movie theater. I'm not kidding you. Now, some of you are thinking, that guy is a real legalist. You know, legalists are those Christians who really are, don't get saved by grace, and they think there's uh, things that Scripture is silent on. It's called the adiaphora that are essential to salvation or to an authentic Christian lifestyle. I don't know if that guy was or not, but what we're dealing with in the text this morning, I don't think Paul is pitting legalists versus people who get grace. I think both parties in this are people that understand that they are saved by grace alone. <clears throat> but in verse 1, he talks about those who are weak in faith. And the reason I think he's not talking about legalists is if you look at verses 5 and 6, he talks about whether you do something or don't do something. These groups are doing it to honor Christ and to praise God. They're not doing it to get saved. So verse 1 says, there are those who are weak in faith. And I think Paul is referring there to a group in the church who know that they are saved by grace, but they would absolutely just cringe if they heard St. Augustine's famous adage, love Christ and do as you please. I want you to think about that phrase. Love Christ and do as you please. I'm with Augustine. I think that is the gospel of grace. My experience is that when you and I develop a genuine, robust, in-depth, personal relationship with Jesus, he opens up a whole new vista to us, showing us that we are much more free than we ever imagined in those areas where Scripture is silent. And so, we're not to lord it over another person. Um, a fellow believer, if they believe that's where Christ is leading them, on those non-essential scripture silent issues. And Paul puts two of them before us in the text this morning. The area of diet and what I'm calling holidays. Let's take them in that order. Is a Christian free to eat anything he or she wants? My executive director at Highland Park Prez in Dallas was Mark Story, still there. We were together for about eight years. And Mark uh, is a great guy. I just love him. He's a dear brother. And uh, he was a hippie during the 60s. 
and came to Christ during that time, came out of that lifestyle, went to law school, became a partner in one of the most prestigious law firms in Dallas. Read Bob Buford's book, Halftime, really thought, I want to spend the last half of my career being significant, not just successful. So he really wanted to work in the church, and so I brought him on as my executive director, and he did a fabulous job. But two little residual hippiedom things were still in Mark's life. Long hair. Does the Bible say how long a man's hair should be? Or maybe how short a woman's skirt should be? Can Christians eat certain things or drink certain things or not? Um, to some people, those issues are of extreme importance. To other Christians, they're kind of trivial. But Mark had long hair, and he was a vegetarian. Now, if I asked Mark, Mark, can Christians eat anything? He would say yes. But I don't, because I've, I've just found, for me, that I'm better able to honor Christ and praise God by not eating meat. And Mark never looked at me and said, you know, Ron, I, you seem like a solid Christian, but I'm really not sure, because you, you eat meat. He never did that. And I have to confess, we had a great relationship. That was not an issue with us. Although, there was a couple times I took him out to lunch, and I'd take him to rib places. And I would tease him. I'd be mean, Mark's eating a salad, you know. But um, with us, it was humorous, and we banner about it. But, it, you know, I didn't lord it over him. In verse 4, Paul says, Who are you to judge someone else? You're not their master. I'm not Mark's master. Christ is. And if Christ was leading Mark to be a vegetarian, then who am I to say, Mark, you don't get grace. You need to join me in a plate of ribs. No. Or should a Christian drink beer? I know Bible-believing, Christ-centered, sold out for Jesus Christians who drink beer. And I know fellow believers who tell me that their relationship with Christ is enhanced. Their praise for God is, is uh, shored up by abstaining completely from alcohol. Great. The Bible's silent on whether you and I can drink or not, or should drink or not. It is clear that we're not to get drunk, but a drinker shouldn't say, non-drinker, you just don't get grace. Jesus drank, you turned water into wine. The abstainer, the teetotaler shouldn't say, I'm not sure you're a Christian because you're imbibing of alcohol. It's how we treat each other. If Christ is leading you one way or the other and you're doing that to praise God and, and honor Christ, then praise be to God. What about holidays? In the text, Paul says, to some Christians, every day is alike, meaning that they don't single out any special day. They're sold out to Christ. They're celebrating the incarnation, resurrection, ascension, every day of their lives. Um, they don't need special days to do that. Uh, I understand that. Wow. Go for it, if that's what Christ is leading you to do. Um, but some feel like, and I'm one of them, that I, I like singling out certain days. Uh, you know, I understand August 14th is every bit Easter as Easter is. Jesus is no less bodily alive today than on Easter Sunday. In fact, we worship on Sunday because Christ was raised from the dead on Sunday. And the early church went with that, leaving behind the Jewish Sabbath. What do we do with our Seventh-day Adventist friends? They believe that the Jewish Sabbath was perpetual, and they worship on Saturday. And Should we look at them and go, you know, you're, you're just they're in chains. You need to come out of the Old Testament and get with the New Testament. What if they looked at us and said, we're not sure about you Presbyterians who worship on a day that originally honored the sun god. No. I know a Presbyterian church that needed to build a larger sanctuary. And to do so, they had to knock down their present sanctuary, which meant they were going to be without a sanctuary for over a year. Well, the Seventh-day Adventist church down the road got wind of that and came to them and said, you can have our sanctuary on Sundays. We're not there. It's yours. Now, were the Seventh-day Adventists thinking, well, we'll let them use it even though they're a bunch of pagans? Were the Presbyterians thinking, well, we'll take them up on their offer even though they're, they don't really get grace. And we'll, let's not interact with them, just use their building. No, actually, those two churches came together and, and came into fellowship and did stuff together. So, let's say you've got a friend who 
wants to celebrate Christmas, the believer, and another one doesn't. You don't, maybe. What do we do? Let's get back to this Christmas thing. As I said earlier, in our Reformed heritage, we're Johnny-come-latelys. During the Reformation, we wanted to throw out anything that smacked of Romanism. And as I say, we didn't know what day Jesus was born on anyway. So back up until the 19th century, on Christmas morning, that was pretty much just another work day for Presbyterian-type Christians until some church historians say Charles Dickens came along and began to romanticize Christmas with Tiny Tim and all that. And we Presbyterians broke down. We just couldn't take it anymore looking in from the outside, and we kind of came on in, and ever since we've been celebrating Christmas. Well, I'm glad we did. You know, Christmas Eve here is the highlight night for me of the year, five services, and I just love it. But if you came to me and said, Ron, I don't go to those, and I don't observe Christmas Eve or Christmas Day, it's because I feel like Christ is leading me to do that every day, and that best honors him and praises God. I'd say, great, great. Uh, but that person shouldn't say, well, everybody that comes to the Christmas Eve services is a bunch of pagans and don't get it. No, it's, let me muck this up even more. What do we do with Santa Claus? There are some Christians in this church who've told me, you know, we threw Santa out the window, we don't tell our kids about him, we keep our kids away from him, rearrange the letters of Santa, spells Satan. And, uh, okay, if Christ is leading that way, great. My mentor at Union Seminary Richmond is Dr. John Leaf, arguably one of the great Reformed theologians of the 20th century. And Dr. Leith was a stickler for good theology. He hammered us with, you've got to be good theologians. His famous phrase was, bad theology always hurts people. And so we were, he taught us to be very meticulous in our theology. But every Christmas, Dr. Leith would send out his Christmas letter to his former students. Man, I couldn't wait for that letter to arrive every year. I'd open it up. It was always scintillating. It was always pithy. It always took me deep into an area of Christmas slash incarnation that I hadn't even seen before, and it always enhanced how I celebrated Christmas. And someone has collected all those letters, and they've published them in book form. They are really great. Lewis, you remember him. And, but then one year, he blew our socks off. It wasn't long before he died, and we get the letter. I open it up, and it's all about Santa Claus. I'm not kidding you. And Dr. Leith waxed romantically about how from little boy on up to his elderly years, he's always felt that Santa brought kind of a wistful, joyful presence to the holidays, realizing that it's just myth. But, and I was like, Dr. Leith? Yeah, but I don't question his, his salvation or his authenticity as a brother in Christ. And our family, we compromised. We decided with our kids... We're going to tell them about the real Santa Claus, St. Nicholas, born-again Christian pastor who took the incarnation, God graciously giving us what we don't deserve, and he then took money and other things, food, to the poor. And we told our kids about, that's the real St. Nicholas. But it's, I think we go awry over these things where Scripture is silent when we start taking them personally. I think that's what Paul's getting at in verses 7 through 9 of our text. When he says, if we live, we live unto the Lord. If we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. I think that's Paul's way of saying, your life, my life, is not about you. It's about Christ. And however you live your life, if you're doing it in an area where Scripture is silent, to honor Christ, to praise God, then you are free in Christ to do that. It may be different, though, than another believer feels led by Christ. But you're not to take it personally. Martin Luther often described the posture of sin as being turned in upon oneself. So your view of life becomes very truncated. It's all about you. All you can see is what you want, your desire. Selfishness, self-centeredness becomes the epitome of the Christian turn inward. And then it gets real personal because you encounter someone who is living differently than you on an area where scripture is silent. You start taking that personally and it becomes divisive. In my quiet time every day, I use a book called 
Operation World. It's about this thick. It's wonderful. It takes you through praying for a different country every day through the year. And um, you learn all kinds of things about the country and what Christ is doing. You know, in the West, the church is going like this. You learn that everywhere else in the world, Christianity is booming. And so it's a real upbeat way to begin my day. But last week, we were praying for North and South Korea. And I learned that the Christian faith came to Korea in 1988, 1888. Presbyterian missionaries took the gospel to Korea, and it took like in no other country in Southeast Asia, to the point where about half the country's Christian, and most of those are Presbyterians. The largest Presbyterian church in the world is Young Nok Presbyterian Church in Seoul. 60,000 plus members. I think they have 6,000 associate pastors. Um, the largest seminary in the world is in Seoul. It's a Presbyterian seminary. It's as big as Baylor University. I'm not talking about the School of Theology. I'm talking about Baylor Nation. It's about 15,000 students. In 1900, there was one Presbyterian denomination in Korea, the Presbyterian Church of Korea. 2016, there's over 100 Presbyterian denominations. And Operation World says that sadly, just about all of those have occurred over a personality clash between church leaders or over adiaphora, the non-essential stuff. You know, do you have a white linen cloth on your communion table during communion or not? Do you do contemporary worship or not? Do you, you know, walk your dog on the left side of the street while you pray or on the right side of the street? And so you have this proliferation, and it's, and it's sad. We're not split over things that the Bible is silent on. Things that Scripture is clear on, we hold to those unwaveringly, but graciously. Real Christians, let me let you in on something. Real Christians go to Sunday school. Is that right? The Bible says nothing about Sunday school. Now, I can give you a hundred reasons why I think you should. But if you came to me and said, Ron, I don't go to Sunday school. Because I, I feel led by Christ that I better honor him and praise him by immersing myself during the week by myself in scripture, or I'm part of a small group on Tuesday nights where we really go deep, I'd say, go for it. I would not say, you're out of line because you don't go to Sunday school. And they shouldn't say everybody goes to Sunday school is, is dodging the real deal or something. No. You've got a difference with a fellow believer, say over Christmas, they're telling you, I don't celebrate any day more than the other because I'm all out for Christ every day. And you say, well, I do celebrate Christmas. Sit down with that person. Ask him, show me how you got there, and I want to encourage you and champion you to always go where Christ is leading you. And I hope you'll do so for me. And when we do that, who knows? Next December, that person might actually send you a Christmas card. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.